way back in the spring of 1990, 10 year old me was given a $5 allowance. In search of something to spend my money on, I came upon something fantastic at my local convenience store newsstand. It was then that I started a lifelong obsession with the gold standard of sequential art, the comic book. Now as an old man, I have decided to open up some old boxes and dig into my comic book collection. I decided it's time for me to review and analyze the illustrations and artists that made me comics crazy. Hey gang, what's going on? This is Chris Crazy House and I want to welcome you once again to another episode of Chris Crazy House Presents Comics Crazy. And we are going to be looking at The Amazing Spider-Man 347 today, continuing the story of Venom's revenge when he gets his revenge on Spider-Man. And we are looking at a very interesting cover for Spider-Man 347 where, you know, very simply done, you know, nothing spectacular as far as the design of it or you know, even the composition, but very simply done of Venom holding Spider-Man's skull. And this was, I remember seeing this on the shelf when it first came out back in the early 90s, and I love this cover. It's since then become a classic cover, one of the classic ones that was done by Eric Larson back then, and Randy Eberlin doing the inks. Just a like I said, simple cover, but very impactful. This will definitely get you to want to snatch this book off the shelves to find out what's going on. Even if you were not a fan of The Amazing Spider-Man back then, this cover was interesting enough to make you want to go pick it up. The fact that you got this big, hulking, nasty-looking monster. Once again, <laughs> Eric Larson is a master of drawing that really nasty mouth that Venom has has got the, the nasty, jagged teeth, big tongue sticking out, slime all over the place, and just very simply holding up Spider-Man's skull. And, you know, the dialogue is, alas, poor Spider-Man, I killed him well, making a Shakespearean reference for those of you who know your Shakespeare and, you know, your Hamlet, you know, the very famous scene of looking at the skull of Yorick and saying I knew him well. You know, so just very simple cover, but very effective in getting you to want to pick it up and figure out what the hell is going on. So we're going to peel this open and take a look at the second part <clears throat> of this revenge story with Venom getting back at Spider-Man. And we open up to Spider-Man lying on the beach, something that we were not expecting to see. If you remember how we left off the last time where Venom tricked Spider-Man into going into the cryogenic chamber and getting frozen. And now he's waking up on the beach. So going from extreme cold to the extreme warmth of laying on a beach. And Spider-Man is kind of groggy, but he pulls himself together and wakes up. This is very unique for Eric Larson to actually do these horizontal type panels. You know, th this was very rarely seen from him at all, where it's just a bunch of horizontal panels going from one instance to another. I'm wondering if this was an editing decision or not, but I guess it works because you're able to showcase how Spider-Man is kind of laying down, being prone, but also it gives you good a good way to fit in your dialogue boxes as well, okay? So we go to the next page and we get an amazing splash page by Eric Larson of Venom kind of pouring down on his webs, looking at Spider-Man on the beach. And once again, this was very similar to the splash page that we saw in the last issue where Venom was kind of coming down from his webs and looking down on the criminal Sly. But now he's doing with Spider-Man and it's done in a perspective way that you can kind of see here, part of the palm tree. So you know that Venom is coming down from a tree, but the perspective is done in a way to just make it look 
make Venom look extremely massive and Spider-Man is being dwarfed by him. So this is a great perspective and just showing the danger that Spider-Man is in. He looks very small compared to this monstrous sized Venom. And I'm glad that Eric Larson got to flex a little bit as far as being able to draw Venom at this size. And, you know, this mouth looks absolutely ridiculous. The fact that, he, you know, he was able to embellish this to look just as menacing and, and ridiculous as possible. I'm glad he got that opportunity because this looks great here. And, you know, we get Venom here explaining what he's even doing with Spider-Man here on the beach. Because he said that, you know, several times when Venom has tried to get his revenge on Spider-Man, they've been interrupted by someone else or whatever. So now Venom has figured out a master plan and he froze Spider-Man in the cryogenic chamber and then booked passage on a boat. And now he, Eddie Brock and Venom are on a deserted island with Spider-Man. So now no one can interrupt him getting his revenge. Now, this is almost atypical of, you know, the villain's plan and probably one of the weirder things you can think of because if you have Spider-Man frozen and he's vulnerable to your attack, why not just go ahead and kill him right then and there? Why bring him to a secret lair <clears throat> where you can have quote unquote privacy to hunt him down and kill him there? You know what I mean? That That seems like a big plot hole, but once again, Eddie Brock slash Venom is not mentally stable. So maybe to him, this was a good idea. But once again, if you got Spider-Man at your mercy, you could have literally just torn him to pieces in that cryogenics chamber and not had to worry about booking passage on a boat to get this body there and, and with the fear he might wake up or whatever. But you got him to this island and now you're going to try to hunt him down instead of just killing him before he could wake up. But once again, you can't ask too many questions with comic book logic or villain logic in these books. But that's the explanation. And before Venom can say any more, Spider-Man webs up his face. Now we know that this is not gonna do anything to Venom really, but it's just giving Spider-Man a chance to kind of put some distance between him and Venom. So Venom, the symbiote opens up on Eddie Brock's face and that rips apart the webbing that Spider-Man put on his face. And at this point, Venom is actually not, he's not too worried about Spider-Man, you know, doing these little tricks because at some point he figures he's going to be able to get a hold of Spider-Man. So that's why at this point he actually starts singing the theme to Gilligan's Island as looking very deranged too in this panel as he's going to hunt down Spider-Man to kill him. So we see that Peter Parker is kind of swinging through the trees here in this deserted island. He decides to try and get some water and refresh himself as, you know, thinking about uh while he's kind of somewhat happy that there won't be any other people that might get in the way, meaning that someone else could actually get hurt while he's fighting Venom. He's also worried by the fact that one of the ways he's always survived dealing with Venom is there was always someone to interrupt their fights. So, you know, now he might have a, there's a conundrum there. He's happy that no innocent bystanders will be hurt, but now there's no one to stop Venom from, having all his focus on Peter Parker. And while he's doing that, while he's getting a drink, we see the symbiote's face in the water. So the symbiote is known for being a, a bit of a shapeshifter and a chameleon and has made itself look like water so that he can sneak up on Peter Parker and he grabs him around the neck and drags him in. This is a, a thing that I've always enjoyed about Venom and the symbiote that he can do that type of camouflage, almost kind of like the Predator, in order to get close to his prey. Now, in this book, the main focus is the action and the fight between Venom and Spider-Man, but we do cut here and there to the women in Peter Parker's life and how they are worried about him. So the first one we focus on is the main one, and that is his wife, Mary Jane. And she went to go stay with some of her family and she's kind of babysitting her nephews outside while it's snowing. And one of the little punks 
hits her upside the head with a snowball and she winds up snapping at them, but they feel bad and they apologize. And then she apologizes for yelling at them because she, you know, she realizes that it's only her worry about Peter that made her snap off on these little punks. You know, I, I would agree. I'll be mad too, MJ, if they hit me upside the head with a snowball like that. That would be grounds for a snowball war. And I would show these little punks no mercy in that regard. But cutting back to this hidden island with the duel between Spider-Man and Venom. And I love this panel here where we see that Venom has kind of disguised himself or camouflaged himself to look kind of like water to fight Spider-Man. This would be something cool to see if, you know, they did Venom properly in the films, like the showcase that he's able to camouflage like that and actually, you know, have him fighting Spider-Man in this way. But I doubt we'll see anything like that anytime soon. But as they're fighting underwater, Peter grabs a log and goes upside Venom's head. And once again, you get kind of like these, Eric Larson likes to do these too, where he has kind of like these jagged edges on his panels when he's showcasing any type of hardcore action, like a, a character getting punched or getting hit in the face. He always kind of does this a little bit. Like back during this time in his career, he would only do it maybe like once on a page. But as we, you know, as we're going forward and we get into seeing some of his own books or when he took over doing the plotting for just the Spider-Man books, we'll see more stuff like that. So after hitting Venom upside the head, Peter swims up trying to get away and make sure he gets some air because he's been underwater for some time now. And Venom surfaces from the water. And once again, he's not really worried about Peter Parker getting away from him this time because they're on a, a deserted island here. And he's actually kind of enjoying himself. The fact that Spider-Man busted open his face that way with that log, but he's sitting there licking the blood and saying, yum, because he's having the time of his life hunting down his greatest enemy. So Peter Parker, while swinging through the trees, finds an abandoned village and feels that this will probably be a good place to, you know, hide away from Venom. But as we see, Venom's actually right behind him, camouflaged again near a palm tree. And we see that the, the symbiote has taken on the texture of this tree and used it to camouflage himself and used it to get in a good haymaker on Spider-Man, knocking him across into the village. And you see how he's kind of hunting him down even more. And as he's doing so, he's changing back to his normal symbiote self. And Spider-Man is just doing his best to get away, okay? Because like I said, Venom is right on top of him. And I, and I enjoyed that in not just this issue, but the last one where, you know, Peter Parker was doing his best just to stay ahead of Venom. And Venom's kind of like right on his tail being very relentless and hunting him down. So Venom steps in on this trap, gets kind of wrapped up in the rope as hanging upside down. And before he could even get a hit in on Venom hanging upside down, Venom moves out of the way and hits Peter with some of the webbing in his own eyes. So Spider-Man is kind of getting a taste of his own medicine. Usually he winds up doing this to one of the, the villains, but now a villain has used that web and webbed him right in his face. So as Peter's trying to swing away, Venom picks up a truck, a pickup truck, and literally hurls it at him. And in doing so, it kind of knocks Spider-Man kind of off his, off his swinging game, but it misses him just enough to go hit the ground. And it hits the ground hard enough to actually go into, into an abandoned mine. So this island was actually a mining colony. So there's actually a lot of abandoned mines and that have been deserted that still exist on this island. And this is going to come up later on as the story progresses. So not only that, but there's lots of methane gas still in these mines as well. So that's gonna, like I said, come up very soon in this story and in this plot. So we do another quick cut back to the mainland and see that another female in Peter's life is worried about him. And that's Felicia Hardy. And she winds up snapping on her boyfriend, Flash Thompson, because she's worried about the life of Peter Parker. 
but she tries to get it together and realize she can't just wait by the phone to see if Peter needs her help. So she decides to go out with Flash and just go hang out and try her best to kind of forget about that, knowing that she can't always worry about the whereabouts of Peter Parker. So we get back to the island and Peter Parker is down in the mine fighting Venom. And as they're fighting in there, Peter winds up tricking Venom into stepping on one of these loose boards and pulling himself out. <laughs> and Venom is very upset by that at this point, saying he's going to eat Spider-Man's lungs for that. And when Peter Parker gets down to the beach, he realizes that there are boats that do come by. So this is a shipping lane. So there are boats that pass by this island every once in a while. So he's going to think, is there a way that he can swim out there and catch one of those boats the next time it comes by? But even as he's thinking about that, he gets caught in a symbiote trap laid by Venom. So Eddie Brock is able to separate the symbiote from himself to try and grab Peter Parker. He's done this before and several other issues of The Amazing Spider-Man. And now he's trying the same trick again, this time coming up under the sand to grab Peter Parker. And it pulls him forward so that Brock can get a hold of Peter Parker. And before he can do that, Peter Parker decides to web up some trees behind him and just ram him dead in his stomach. So, which actually does give him a good hit because this way Parker or Brock is not covered completely by the symbiote. So now he's able to be hurt a lot better. And once again, we got that jagged edge on this panel to show uh, just the impact of this action of Spider-Man ramming himself into Eddie Brock slash Venom. He rams him with so much force that it actually knocks Brock back into the forest and into some palm trees. And as he does, that's when Spider-Man decides to swing off as the sun goes down on this island. And the last woman in Peter Parker's life is Aunt May, who's always worried about him in some way, shape, form, or fashion, as parents do. But she's also sitting there chilling with her new boyfriend, Willie Lumpkin. And if you remember in my review of Mephisto, versus the Fantastic Four, I told you about Willie Lumpkin, the mailman, and how he used to date Aunt May. And this is one of the scenes showcasing how he was dating Aunt May. So we get here to Peter Parker kind of going through the, the abandoned village on this island. And we see that there's a cemetery there as well with lots of bones and open graves still existing in this jungle. Kind of reminds me of the the village from, if anyone's ever seen the, the movie Zombie done by uh, Lucio Fulucci. <laughs> That's what this this part reminds me of because the zombies came out of the graveyard on the island. But Peter Parker is kind of looking through there and these, once again, these skulls and these skeletons will come back into play in this story. And we see right here that Peter finds Eddie Brock slash Venom just sort of chilling by the fire on the island as the sun goes down. And we see the, the symbiote is actually peeled off of him and kind of, you know, just sitting back and keeping guard while Eddie Brock kind of warms up by the fire. And Peter Parker knows that he's not, the only way he's going to survive this situation is if Eddie Brock believes that he's dead, okay? Because he knows that's the only thing that, Eddie Brock slash Venom wants to accomplish is his death. So he's thinking that's the only thing that's going to give him satisfaction and get Eddie Brock to leave him alone. So he uses his web, grabs one of the fiery logs off of the fire. And that's when Eddie Brock transforms back into Venom to go chase him. And I love this panel. I just love the way Venom looks in this panel. You can see he's a lot more angry you know, and more vicious looking like his face, like he's almost anticipating the kill to a point where, you know, he knows that Peter Parker is close. So he's just running relentlessly through the trees with his mouth agape like that, looking like a complete savage predator chasing down Peter Parker. So Peter Parker gets hold of that torch and he tries webbing up some palm trees just to slow him down. 
but it's not holding back Venom. Venom runs through that webbing very quickly because he wants to get his hands on Spider-Man. <clears throat> and in doing so, he quickly grabs one of these old cars there and throws it at Peter Parker and throws it, you know, he can't barely see him, but he can see the, the, the torch he's holding in his hand and he throws it as hard as he can and it lands directly on Peter Parker slash Spider-Man. And there's quiet for a second because the torch falls to the ground and then we see a giant explosion. So what we're led to believe is the gas from those old abandoned mines, the methane gas, as you know, plus the car and the torch all mixed into one and caused this giant explosion. And that's actually killed Spider-Man. <clears throat> so when Eddie Brock goes over to the, the area to find where Peter Parker is, he sees that all he finds is a skeleton with the Spider-Man costume on. Now, if he had asked some questions or did some more investigating, he probably would have figured out that that wasn't the case, that Peter Parker, a.k.a. Spider-Man, wasn't dead. But he's so happy that he's finally killed his enemy that all he cares about is he found the skeleton and, and Spider-Man is dead and he has complete happiness and satisfaction, almost kind of like Thanos after he did the snap. That's how Eddie Brock feels right now to the point where he's decided that he's going to stay on the island and just live there and live in happiness and peace now that Spider-Man is dead. And he feels so good, he changes, the symbiote changes into some vacation clothes and he runs across the beach, <laughs> kind of looking like Sylvester Stallone and, and uh, Carl Weathers on the beach in Rocky Three, And we see that Peter Parker survived because he actually went and swam out there to one of those boats and got on the boat and is going away from the island. So I guess the writer Dave Michelini was trying to figure out a way to get rid of Venom this time without, you know, I guess killing him or locking him up or having the symbiote get disintegrated. So now they came up with the idea that Eddie Brock and the symbiote are still alive, but they believe that Spider-Man is dead and they're going to stay on this abandoned island. So there's no TV or radio out there. So they won't know that Spider-Man is actually alive and well. So <laughs> I don't know how they thought that was going to work. And even with the in-universe explanation for, you know, Peter Parker to escape Venom in this way, like why would he think that Venom would no longer be a threat in this, you know, case? Like why wouldn't he want to send someone out there to contain this character before he could come back and cause more havoc? Why would he think that Eddie Brock and Venom would just stay there and not cause any more trouble? I don't know, but that's, you know, that's the explanation we're getting in this book. So very good book, amazing action drawn by Eric Larson and uh, Randy Eberlin. But uh, in my opinion, the ending leaves a little, is a little less to be desired in my opinion. It almost kind of seems like to me, like they were running out of ideas and weren't exactly sure how to end this particular story, but they knew they had to get to the next story, which didn't involve Venom at all. But, you know, I'm not exactly sure what the story was behind all of this. But once again, I did I was not very appreciative of how it ended. Once again, great cover, amazing artwork, amazing action. I love the fact of, you know, Peter being hunted down by Venom on this abandoned island and then just kind of going mano y mano. But, uh the ending just wasn't as strong as it could have been. But I mean, maybe this was just a clever way to keep Venom alive so he can come back later because he, he shows up again when Carnage shows up. So when we they introduce Carnage, they have to go and get Venom to get his help in order to capture and fight Carnage. So maybe that's why it was like this. Maybe I don't know if Carnage was always a plan. I know that they did introduce the carnage symbiote somewhat when, you know, Venom escaped from prison, the symbiote had given birth and left part of itself, it's part of its spawn there at the prison. And that was, that's what became carnage later on. But I'm not sure exactly how the, if this was super planned far ahead or what, but maybe so. 
Anyway, folks, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Chris Crazy House Presents Comics Crazy. I know I did. I've always enjoyed these Eric Larson issues of Amazing Spider-Man. You can let me know how you like it in the comments section. I very much like to hear that. You know, if you want to hit the like button to help Eddie Brock get some better vacation clothes, you can do that and go ahead and subscribe to this channel for more episodes of Comics Crazy and seeing more of my own personal artwork. And make sure you go ahead and share this with your fellow comic book fans out there who love nostalgic comics from back in the day. Anyway, folks, this is Chris Crazy House signing out. Peace.